Um, I'm going to spotlight uh, you, Jean-Christophe, um, and uh, you should feel free to start whenever you're ready. All right, so thank you very much. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Uh, as announced yesterday, uh, now we're going to start uh, chapter one, talking about large deviations and convex analysis. So these are very uh, wide topics, but we are only going to focus on a selection of results, which uh, will be at least uh, informative to what comes next. Not necessarily crucial, but uh, informative. And to start with uh, large deviations, I'm going to focus on an example where we can compute things explicitly. And so I'm going to focus on the case when we, we are looking at the sum of uh, independent Bernoulli random variables. So I'm going to write Xn for these variables. Uh, so independent Bernoulli and so they take the value one with probability p and the value zero with probability one minus p. Um, so the mean value is, is p and we know from the low large numbers that if I compute the sum, I'm going to write the sum S capital N, so one over N some little n from uh, one to capital N of Xn. Um, this we know is um, converges um, almost surely to P as N goes to infinity. And the question large deviation asks is, before we are at the limit, what does the, how does the probability that Sn is equal to something other than P behave? So surely it will go to zero, but uh, can we specify exactly how? And this question is not answered by uh, the central limit theorem because the central limit theorem uh, tells us about deviations from P of order one over square root of N. But here we are asking about deviations of order one. So that's why it's called a large deviation. So the typical deviation of Sn is of order one over square root of n. And this is, here we are going to ask about order one deviation. Um, so yes, in this context, we're going to be able to compute things exactly, essentially, because um, if I ask myself, what's the probability that Sn is equal to k over n for k between uh, zero and n, then the answer is just n choose k and then uh, p to the k one minus p to the n minus k. I think um, uh, this is clear. And and so I want to understand this um, how this behaves when uh, when. Um, n goes to infinity and k over n remains uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of some fixed value. So uh, in order to do that, I'm going to use a, an equivalent for k factorial, just to uh, simplify this combinatorial factor. And so this is a, a simpler version of uh, Stirling's formula, if you want. This is the same as the exponential of k log of k over e plus a small correction of order logarithm. Of K. So, so I'm going to think about uh, K over N as being uh, at least close to a value which is a, which we stays away from the boundaries of the interval. So away from uh, zero and N and, and sorry, zero and one and, and let N go to infinity. So let's say it denotes, I'm going to be a little bit informal in this derivation, but hopefully you can uh, make more precise sense of it if you want. So X, I'm going to write X instead of K over N. And I'm going to assume that, so assume 
just to, to make the the computations uh, rigorous, uh, I want to assume that x is away from from zero and one. By by this, I mean that you should think that k and x um, will maybe change a little bit as n goes to infinity. But I want to think of x as being essentially fixed, you know, except for this constraint that it's an integer divided by n. And, and I want to make sure that uniformly over this uh, going to n go to infinity, x remains, let's say, at distance delta away from 0 and 1. Okay. And, and so with, with this convention, this uh, combinatorial factor, this n choose k, I can rewrite as, so this is n factorial divided by k factorial n minus k factorial. So if I use this equivalent above, uh, this will be n log of n over e. This is the n factorial. And then there's the uh, k factorial. So k I'm going to write nx. And then there's the n minus k uh, factorial which I'm, I'm writing as n one minus x. And maybe I'll smuggle in the, the, the error here. Okay, so, so because I assume that x is away from zero and one, the error term will be over the big O of log n. Okay, just to, to make my life easy. And we see that there are simplifications in this expression. Maybe initially you think that this is in the exponential, it looks like there are some n log n uh, terms, but you see that they simplify. Now, if I expand the, the logarithm here, uh, I have n log n uh, here. And you know, if I, if instead of log of nx, nx here, I write log, log n plus log x, I will have nx log n and then n one minus x uh, log n. So, so all of the n log n's will disappear. Okay, so, so I want to, oops, I want to clarify that this indeed happens. I'm going to rewrite this expression. Um, and similarly, the, the one over e guys, they will also uh, disappear for the same reason. Okay, so what I end up with is minus n um, x log x minus n one minus x log one minus x. And then still my error with the O of log n. So far so good. So, so recall that I'm doing this computation about this combinatorial factor because I want to understand this, this probability here. Okay, the probability that Sn is equal to x in fact. So in this uh, expression, there is the combinatorial factor and there's this p to the k, one minus p to the n minus k. So let's uh, bring, bring back this uh, p to the k and one minus p to the n minus k in the, in the computation. Let me just, uh, oops. So p to the k, I'm going to write this as uh, exponential of k log p, and k is nx. So if I want, I can, uh, you know, by bringing this term together with the term above, this is going to be, I can write this as nx log of x over p. Maybe I'm going to bracket this like this. And, and the other term will be of similar form. So, so then we have one minus x log of one minus x divided by one minus p. Okay, and then the error term. All right, so, so that's, that's the end of the, this computation I wanted to do. I'm going to give a name to this, um, 
to this term. Where is it? So, so this thing here, I'm going to call I of X. Okay, so when I write uh, equal two dots, it, it means uh, by definition. Okay, so I define I of X like this. So if you plot I of X, it, it looks like this. Um, okay, let me try to do a decent plot. Okay, so, so it's defined between zero and one. And okay, it's some value at zero, it's some value at one, and it, it vanishes at P, because that's easy to see. So, I mean, and also we kind of expect that, uh, okay, maybe it's not completely obvious, but the probability that SN is, is equal to P or in some, uh, you know, at some value very close to P is actually sub exponential. And any other, you know, if you ask it to be, um, I don't know, let's say P is one half, and you, you wonder what's the probability that SN is actually 0.6, then this calculation reveals that this probability is exponentially small in N. And moreover, it tells you exactly what coefficient in the exponential uh, there is. Okay, it's this I at uh, 0 0.6. Does that make sense? And notice also that I, this function I is, is convex, in fact, strictly convex. Okay, so, so if I summarize this calculation, uh, so let's say conclusion. Um, let's say if I, if I want to be a bit uh, precise with my, With, with my uh, you know x being away from zero and one, I can say for every delta positive, uh, if x is between delta and one minus delta, so let's say delta is small. Okay, otherwise x is uh, doesn't really make sense to ask for this. And um, and e is of the form. Uh, k over n for some integer k. Then uh, p sn equals x is exponential of minus n i of x plus b go of log n. And the big O depends on the delta as, as, a, as I have written in there. Oh yeah, that's a nice thing. Thanks, uh, Luigi, for this comment. All right, so, so that's the, the first thing I wanted to say. And the second thing I want to say is that uh, perhaps we want to ask um, other questions then. Uh, so, so if I, again, think of P as being one half, Instead of asking SN to be uh, in, in a neighborhood of 0.6, maybe what I care about is only that SN is at least 0.6, but uh, I don't mind if it's uh, much, much bigger than 0.6. So, so what about, so let's say for any X between P and one, um, we can observe we can so so you know if I if I try to understand the probability that sn is at least equal to x so the the, the computation I'm going to do now should uh, evoke this exercise one in the first problem set because I'm going to to say that you know these these quantities, you can think of it as a sum of exponentially unlikely terms, and in fact, whether you look at the sum or whether you look at the maximum of these terms, in the limit of large n, the behavior is the same. Okay, so so I'm going to um, do this uh, do these observations here. Um, 
so so here I can if I if I want to start with the lower bound, I can just um, replace this by the probability that Sn is equal to let's say the integer part of Nx. This, this is the the largest integer at least equal to Nx divided by n. And this we have just seen behaves like exponential of minus n i of this quantity, nx divided by n plus o of log n. And this function i is continuous. I, I, I mean, we, we have seen the explicit expression. And in fact, it's differentiable. So I can insert the error here. Uh, you know, I, if I replace this i of uh, the largest integer, etc., by just i of x, the error is over the one. Okay. So after I multiply it by n, so I can just uh, put it into the error term. So in fact, you see that if I ask the probability that Sn is equal to x, or if it's larger than or equal to x, basically I get the same behavior. Yeah, and this is the large deviation type event. Asking that it's at least equal to x will be realized by basically making Sn be equal to x. So that was the lower bound. If I want to fully justify what I said, I should also prove the converse bound. Let me do this. So it's really in the spirit of this exercise one. This I can bound by the sum of the terms. So let's say this time I'm going to take the smallest integer. Um, sorry, the, the largest integer uh, below uh, or equal to xn. And okay, so I'm not going to justify this uh, very carefully, but at least intuitively. So here we're having x above the above p. So so this function probability of Sn equal to k over n will be increasing with k. Okay, so so here I can bound this by the number of terms, and I'm going to uh, brutally bound the number of terms in the sum by n. Okay, maybe I should even write n plus one times the probability that Sn is equal to the first of these terms, Xn divided by n. Okay, so, so this is by a monoticity property, which I, I don't justify, but you, you can verify uh, if, you, if you are patient. Okay, and now again, uh, we know that this probability behaves like exponential minus n Okay, and I'm going to directly write i of x this time. Okay, so for the same reason as before. And again, the, this n plus one in front, I can absorb into the, the error term. Okay, so, so the conclusion of these computations is that for every x between p and one, we have that the probability that Sn is larger than or equal to x is exponential of minus n i of x plus o of log n. Okay, and you can verify that similarly, if you, if you ask yourself what happens for x below the mean value, so for every x between zero and one and p, sorry, the probability that Sn is less than x is going to be exponential of minus n i of x again. 
Let's press on the alter. Okay, and, and the, the whole reason for this is exactly in the spirit of this uh, first exercise of the forum set, okay? because whether, whether we're keeping a sum of terms or the maximum of the terms, the behavior asymptotically is the same. And you know, just to, to clarify, in this derivation, what I, I don't care very much what's the exact form of the error term. Okay? What I want to display is just the, the leading behavior. Like it's exponential minus n i of x. And um, so I'm going to suggest another exercise, uh, which is not uh, part of the problem set. But you, you, using the, 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 these observations above, so, so here we have studied the property that Sn belongs to the interval x plus infinity or minus infinity x. And the claim here is that you can generalize this to arbitrary measurable sets in the following way. So for every measurable set, If I look at the lim soup as n goes to infinity of one over n log so when we look at arbitrary sets uh, uh, so I'm not sure what so I, I see a question in the chat how did I arrive at this conclusion? Uh, so let me back up for, for a second. Um, so, so this is the consequence of the two bars we have proved uh, just before. Okay, so we had, you know, I, I study. So, so we, we start from from this quantity. We have this lower bound, and then uh, we also have the converse bound. Okay. So, if I combine the two bounds, uh, I get the result. Sounds good. Everything is, is absorbed into the error term. And I, I did not explain for this side, but it's the same. It's the same argument, except you have to uh, think about x being below p. All right, so, so let me come back here. So when we look at arbitrary sets, uh, we have to be a bit more careful. and so when when we when you try to write down an upper bound, uh, it's convenient to replace the, the set by its closure. So it's clear that the probability that S n belongs to the closure of A will be something uh, larger. And and then I'm going to use a bound that refers to this closed set. So the it's, this is going to be smaller than the if of i of x for x in the closure of the set. Okay, so a bar means the closure of the set. Okay, so I claim it's possible to, to show that this is true. And for the converse bound, um, So here I'm going to use the the interior of the set A uh, as the as the lower bound. So it's clear I can replace A by its by its uh, interior and get a lower bound. And, and from there I claim that this object is bounded from below by the inf of i of x for x in the interior. Okay, so so this notation. Uh, this is the interior of A, and this is the closure of A. Ah, okay. Uh, I see another question in the chat. It's okay. So I come back to this calculation. So, so the question in the chat is about this passage. Um, so, as as written in the chat, it's not true. What you wrote in the chat is not true. 
But what I wrote uh, here is true because O of log n uh, absorbs this uh, n plus one term. Okay, n plus one, you can write this as exponential of log n. And then you have uh, you know, just an extra log n. Okay, so it's just absorbed into the big O of log n. All right, let me uh, come back here. Okay, so, so it, it's, it's important to, you know, one has to be a bit careful when we try to make statements which talk about general sets, because for instance, you see that this Sn, it takes only values which are of the form an integer divided by n. So if you're uh, nasty, like if A for instance is the set of real numbers uh, take away the rational numbers, uh, you know, SN will never be in this set, but if you take the inf of i of x over this set, you will get uh, zero. So, so you'll have a contradiction in your estimate. So in order to avoid this, uh, you have to take this uh, interior or closure, depending on the bound you, you want to state. Okay, and, and, and this is the formulation of a general large deviation principle for the random variable SN. Okay, so I'm going a bit faster on what large deviations are, and I'm sorry I have to uh, make you swallow all of this, but um, okay. I hope you take some message out of it, uh, even if I am a bit uh, fast. So, so when, whenever these two conditions are satisfied, We say that the, the sequence of random variables SN satisfies a large deviation principle with speed n and rate function i. So the speed is, is what appears here. Okay, so, so informally you can write, so let me write informally. the probability that Sn is equal to X or maybe it's close to X is like exponential of minus N I of X. Okay, and the speed is, is what uh, shows up here in this exponential. Okay, exponential of minus is N, that is the speed and then I of X, that is the rate function. All right, so even though I was kind of quick, I, I gave a justification of the fact that the sequence of Bernoulli random variables, independent Bernoulli random variables, when we compute this, uh, the sum of these random variables, this sum satisfies a large deviation principle with, with speed n and with a rate function, which we found, which is this, uh, okay, this function I call i. Okay, and we, we did so using explicit computations, basically based on uh, Stirling's approximation. Now this is nice, but you may ask, what about other random variables? Let's say, um, let's say bounded random variables, but still uh, independent and identically distributed, and we still compute the sum. So what about, Uh, marginal random variables. So say that oops, uh, 
I'll, I'll just say boundary to make it convenient to, to not worry about um, integration, integrability questions. And let's say they are centered also without loss of generality. Um, so independent and identically distributed random variables. And let's say that X is non-negative. And maybe I also take a, a parameter, lambda. Okay, maybe forget about this for now. Uh, X is non-negative, and I want to understand the probability that, so Sn is defined as before. Okay, one over N, uh, the sum for, for K equals one to N of Xk. And I'm asking, what's the probability that Sn is larger than or equal to X? I would like to recover uh, a result similar to the one we found for for Bernoulli random variables. And let's say for now that I want to find an upper bound. Okay, so so I want to find an upper bound. Um, so one thing I could try to do is is use a Markov's inequality. And I could say, oh, this is smaller than the expectation of S n divided by x. Okay, let's say that x is positive. That's true, but uh, that's not very nice because, well, no, that's not true because SN is not non-negative. So maybe I should do a second moment instead. Okay, so if I do uh, Markov inequality with the second moment, I will write on the right-hand side exp expectation of SN square divided by X square. Okay. And expectation of S n square, it, it behaves like one over n. So it's interesting, but it, it gives me a bound which decays like one over n as n goes to infinity. But in view of what we've done with uh, Bernoulli random variables, we know that at least for some random variables, this decay is actually exponential in n. So this bound we get like this is not good enough. And so you say, okay, uh, first moment uh, that was wrong. Uh, say, I mean, I should have taken absolute values for for the for for, that, for SN. Second moment gives me one over n. Maybe I could try the fourth moment of SN. Okay, so I compute the fourth moment of SN, and I get uh, so the bound will be exponent expe expectation of SN to the four divided by x to the four. And here I would get a bit better, but still a polynomial in n. So we seem to you know, have some improvement, but we are not getting uh, far enough. And in fact, here the idea is to use the exponential function um, to do this uh, Markov inequality argument. So let me write it down. We're going to write this as I can write it like, like this. So, so let's say I fix a, a lambda non-negative. You know, the, the exponential function is non-decreasing, so, so this is correct. And now I use a Markov's inequality. So this is smaller than the expectation of exponential lambda Sn divided by exp exponential of lambda x. And now I should remember what is the definition of SN. So, okay, let me keep the exponential minus lambda x. And then, oh, and I want to put an N, sorry, I forgot. Um, let me insert an N in, in front of it. Because I want to see exponential decay, it would be good for me to put an N here. Okay, so, so this, this makes me happy because I see exponential decay in N already. And hopefully I can do something with, with what's, what's, uh, what's left. So lambda N S10 is uh, that times the sum of the variables. So E of lambda X1 plus plus X1. So, so the exponential function is doing uh, two things which are very nice to us. 
for us, most importantly, it, it, it seems to uh, uh, show promise for, for giving us exponential decay in N, which is what we want. And secondly, there's some, some other thing which is very nice, which is that when the variables are independent, we see that this expectation can be simplified. The exponential of the sum is a product of the exponent shots. And, and then by independence, we can rewrite this as the product of the expectation. Okay, so this is the same as exponential of minus lambda n x times the expectation of exponential lambda x1 to the power of n, which I'm going to rewrite as exponential of minus n, then parentheses, lambda x minus psi of lambda, where psi of lambda being defined by uh, the logarithm of the expectation of the exponential of lambda x1. Okay, so yesterday I had announced that we would see uh, Laplace transforms uh, showing up already with, with large deviations. So here is a Laplace transform. Yeah, you, you, we, we could call this the Laplace transform or maybe log Laplace transform of the random variable x1. And I think I missed the parentheses here. So if you're with me here, I, I started trying to estimate this, this probability that Sn is larger than or equal to x. And I did this calculation. And this calculation is valid for any lambda non-negative. So now that I see this, I should, um, I should make my bound as good as possible. And this is by taking the, uh, the infimum over lambda on the right-hand side. Okay, now um, if I take the infimum over lambda, so we have shown that the probability that Sn is larger than or equal to x, this is always smaller than the exponential of um, minus n. So, so I take the inf over lambda. Um, yeah, they are identically distributed. I'm not assuming that they are equal. Uh, of um, so exponential minus n times the the supremum over lambda non-negative of lambda x minus psi of lambda. Okay. And, and in fact, what's really remarkable is that this computation, which um, maybe looks a little bit ad hoc when you first see it, because we just you know, decide we're going to use the exponential function, in fact, is asymptotically sharp in the sense that you know, if, you, if, you, if you look at this probability, you take the log, you divide by n, and you ask what is the limit. In fact, the limit is indeed uh, minus this supremum. Okay, and, and this is uh, the more general version of large deviations for independent and identically distributed random variables. Yes, exactly, and uh, some more convex analysis is showing up. So, so let me denote. I'm going to use a notation for for this supremum over lambda. So I'm, you know, when, when you give me a function psi, I'm going to write psi star for the function defined like this. So the supremum over lambda, in fact, here I take lambda in R of lambda x minus psi of lambda. You know, in the computation above, um, in the computation here, it's only soup over lambda non-negative which appears, but we had x positive. So you can show that 
um, when X is positive because the variables are centered, taking the soup of a lambda non-negative or the soup of a lambda in R is the same. Uh, I think there is a proof of this in the handwritten notes. But, uh, it's not very difficult to show. So, so really what is showing up here, this is really Psi star. And indeed, as someone uh, wrote down in the chat, uh, this is the, some people call it Legendre transform. I would just call it the, the convex dual of the function Psi. And no, this is like, you know, the limit. So, so the claim is that, so let me write down the, the precise theorem now, and then I'm going to answer the question in the chat. So here is the theorem, which I have not proved now, I only proved one bound, but here is the theorem. So it's large deviations for IID random variables. So let me, So independent and identically distributed random variables. And for convenience, I'm going to assume that the, this uh, Laplace transform is finite for every lambda. This is not really necessary, but I just want to make my life convenient for every lambda in R. And, and define the, this uh, Laplace transform, Psi of lambda, to be the log of this quantity. Okay, so maybe I could fancy to call this the, the free energy of X1. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stick to Laplace transform. And, and again, we, we define the Psi star as above, okay? Psi star of X is the supremum of lambda X minus Psi of lambda. So the claim is that the, the random variable SN, which is you know, one over N, uh, sum of XK, satisfies the large deviation principle with speed n and rate function psi star. So is the statement clear? I was quite fast uh, in uh, even defining what large deviation means, but. Uh... Yes, so now I can, so if, if the statement is clear, then I can comment on the, on the question in the chat, which is, can we use other functions on exponential in the derivation above? So I mentioned you can use the square function or, the, or, or many other functions and the, the next comment in the chat uh, confirms this, it's true. But if you want to identify the the correct uh, behavior as n goes to infinity. So so this theorem I have not proved, but it says that this this quantity we observe that that shows up when you use the exponential function, this uh, psi star, is in fact the correct number. It is the is the correct value for the limit of one over n log of the probability. So you can use other functions, but if you want to put your finger on the right limit, then you'd better use the exponential function. In fact. Is the statement at least sort of clear? I'm not going to be uh, super precise, but maybe it's a good time for a little break. Um, so, so let's take a, let's take ten minutes of, of break, and uh, I'm I'm very happy to uh, answer more questions uh, if needs be during the break. Yes, yes. So, so you don't need to assume that it's finite everywhere. Like, uh, I think it's, 
if you assume that it's finite in a neighborhood of the origin, that will be enough, for instance. And uh, if you don't assume that it's finite in a neighborhood of the origin, um, I think then the, the statement no longer makes a lot of sense. So, and so, so then the, the function will be finite in the neighborhood of the origin and infinite elsewhere. But you can still make sense of the convex dual. You know, when you take this supremum, um, the quantity in the supremum will be either finite or minus infinity. But so you just ignore these values of lambda for which uh, psi of lambda is plus infinity. So it, it's, psi star is still well defined and, and the, the statement is still valid. Haha, <laughs> another good question. So um, if we take the, the, so the question is, what's the relationship between psi star and this function i of x we discussed at the beginning? So uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, question, and, and I, I'm going to perhaps a bit uh, nastily uh, add it as a little exercise. So, so verify that for that if you take x1 to be uh, Bernoulli with, with parameter p, as, as in the beginning, then you can define this function psi uh, for uh, x1, and then you can define psi star. And, and this psi star should be i. Right? So I, I, I use it, I, I say it is an exercise, but uh, it, it's in the notes, in fact. And if you look, uh, if you look at the notes, at the handwritten notes, uh, you will find it. So if it's not, uh, yeah, but, but it's nice to rederive it because uh, I find it cute at least. I find it nice. Um, ah, this question is more philosophical. I'm not sure how to address it. Uh, maybe if, if you can, yeah, uh, difficult to. Ah, yeah, uh, so, so just as a, as a side comment, uh, going back to the previous question, another case where it's nice to compute the large deviation uh, rate function is when you take x1 to be a gas. In this case, the, this log Laplace or this Laplace transform is just a lambda square over two. If let's say there are standard gaussians and the, the convex dual of uh, lambda square over two is x square over two. So, for Gaussians, the, the rate function is x squared over two. You, you can compute uh, large deviations for other functions. Ah, yeah, sorry. Thanks for, yes, yes. So this is large deviations exactly for the reason we just said, yeah. And yeah, so, so I, I could also make a parallel with uh, something Luigi mentioned yesterday. So. Uh, yesterday, Luigi talked about universality. So the central limit theorem is an example. We have universality because any random variables we take, we see this Gaussian showing up in the limit. But large deviations is not of this sort. You know, the, the behavior of the large deviations really depend on the law in some more intrinsic way. You know, there's no, like for instance, you know, for, for Bernoulli random variables, the rate function is this function i of x. And for the Gaussians, I just said that the, the rate function is x squared over two. So we see that uh, there is no, uh, let's say, uh, disappearance of the, of the microscopy details when you ask about large deviations. And it sort of makes sense you know, for, like, to, to make it even more uh, vivid. When you take these Bernoulli random variables, if you ask for the sum to be you know, this sum normalized by n, if you want it to be larger than two, let's say, this is impossible. Right? It's not possible that when you sum these Bernoulli random variables, n of them, and you divide by n, you get something which is larger than two. Okay. While well, for Gaussians, uh, it is actually possible. So, and so it's clear that uh, there are some differences between uh, Bernoulli's and Gaussians in this case. Yeah, I had mixed 
Ah, uh, yeah. So, so another question is about uh, uh, Markov chains. Um, so, so here I, I would uh, suggest to uh, consult. I think it's it's uh, so you can find in. Uh, so, so the most uh, fundamental reference for large deviations is the book of Dembo and Zaituni, which is extremely comprehensive. But if you want to know about Markov chains, you can also look into the book of Dan Hollander on large deviations. I think both have the title large deviations. And I think the book of Dan Hollander is, is more accessible. And I think it does cover Markov chains. It's a very nice uh, result to uh, derive what is the right function for Markov chain. Both are large deviations. Both the titles are large deviations. Oh, yeah, I should type it. So then Hollander is as written in the chat by Omer. And, and shortly, I'm going to uh, state a more general result than the one uh, which is currently displayed. And I'm not going to take time to prove it uh, today with you. But if you go to, the, to see the handwritten notes, there is a proof there. So in particular, uh, you can find a proof of uh, this result about IID random variables from the notes, but it does not this does not cover Markov chain. Yes, that's right. So another question in the chat is, what does it mean this uh, satisfying a large deviation principle with speed n and weight function uh, psi star? Yes, it means exactly that these inequalities we, we have seen uh, uh, here are valid, except you replace i by psi star. Thanks for the question. This is uh, quite <laughs> important. All right, so I'm going to resume. Um, so in fact, at least as far as the as this upper bound is concerned, we can imagine. So I want to imagine a generalization of this statement, which does not necessarily assume that the variables are independent. And we, we will see. I, I want to display it because. Um, Okay, I'm going to state the result and then I'm going to explain exactly why I think it's interesting. So, so let's suppose for, for a moment that now we, we have this random variable SN 
but it does not have a super obvious decomposition into a sum of independent random variables. It's just some random variable we care about. We would like to understand its large deviations, but it does not have an obvious um, you know, sum of independent things structure. We can still apply this uh, inequality that is on display here. We, we can still, oops, sorry, uh, here. Okay, this is still okay. Why not? And, and so what was nice with when we had this decomposition of SN into a sum of random variables is that we could compute uh, this uh, Laplace transform of N SN. But perhaps instead I could just postulate that this function
it's pretty interesting. So if we were to believe that large deviations is valid with this rate function, it would say that whenever x is between minus one and one in the entire ent interval between minus one and one, it's you know, the probability that Sn uh, is somewhere in there is sub exponential. It's exponential of minus n times, uh, uh, times zero plus a little lower than. Okay, so, so, so in particular, we should have that the probability that Sn belongs to, let's say, minus one half, one half. This should be, so if the theorem was, was true, this should be greater than uh, exponential of uh, minus little lower than. Okay. I mean, maybe a better way to write it would be that one over n log of this probability, the lim in for this should be greater than or equal to zero. But in fact, it's not at all like this because this probability is zero. This thing is zero. So when we take the log, we should think of this as being minus infinity. Okay. So problem. So so problem. So if you're not convinced by the fact that here I'm using, you know, that log of zero is minus infinity, you you can fine tune this argument a little bit. You you just go back to the definition of SN and you allow a, a, an extremely tiny probability for Sn to be equal to zero. Okay, so let's say it's um, with probability exponential of minus n square, uh, Sn is equal to zero. And otherwise it's equally balanced between uh, one and minus one. Then you know, the entire thing I just said is still valid. And you see that this log probability will not satisfy what large deviations ask for. Okay, and, and the, the moral of the story, if you want, is that for, for this specific example I chose, the probability that Sn is around X, this is not a convex function of X. You, you, when, we, when we say that one over N log of P Sn equals X, should look like psi star of x. In particular, so I have not explained that yet, but psi star is a convex function of x. And, and so you would have that, you would want that, that this thing is convex as a function of x. But the, the function I, I, I you know, the Sn I chose does not satisfy its property. You know, it can be one, it can be minus one, but in between, um, this is extremely, this is impossible for SN or extremely unlikely if you want. Okay, and this does not occur when we do sums of variables because, uh, yeah, okay, I, have, I should explain more, but uh, it, it, when you do sums of independent random variables, this, this cannot occur because you can always make it so that maybe, you know, some part of the of the variables uh, take some value, the other part take the other extreme value. And so you can realize any convex combination of, of, these, uh, of these values. So, so this, this question does not show up if Sn is the sum of IID on a variable. So in general, maybe a, a, a takeaway message is that in general, what, what is revealed uh, when we do this psi star thing is the, is the convex envelope of the function which is here. And when psi is C1, uh, in some sense, it's, it's telling us that actually this, this is fine, this function is really convex, so we are in good shape. Okay, so, so if you did not understand my heuristic comments at the end, uh, don't worry, uh, this is not crucial. All right, so, so in the short amount of time that remains, I hope to continue with uh, uh, displaying interesting like uh, results which uh, I think uh, are useful to have as a background. And so, so you've seen that when we discuss large deviations, there is a lot of uh, convex analysis questions which show up. So I want to uh, 
recall to ourselves a few things about convex analysis. So just to make sure we are on the same page, I'm going to only consider functions defined on RD. Ah, uh, no, yeah, that, sorry, there's a question in the chat because I said that without loss of generality, we, I can display the statement with speed n. I just mean that uh, you will have to relabel a sequence if the speed is not n. But uh, in general, it's not an easy matter to determine what is the, the correct speed if, if I give you a specific sequence. It's just that you know, if you once you have figured out what is the correct speed, uh, you can apply the same result by just relabeling the sequence. But it's not uh, there's no magic easy way to guess it. But maybe a good practice is to try to compute these Laplace transforms and see uh, you know under which uh, for, for which uh, speeds uh, does this have non-trivial behavior. That would be a good approach to try to understand what is the correct speed. So yeah, for my convex analysis part, I'm going to only focus on functions defined on RD. And for convenience, I, I allow the function to also take the value plus infinity if it wants. And we say that this is convex if for every x, y in RD and alpha between zero and one, we have that f of alpha x plus one minus alpha y is smaller than or equal to alpha f of x plus one minus alpha f of y. So yeah, the, the one, one thing which is convenient with allowing the function to take value plus infinity is that I can always uh, pretend my function is defined everywhere on RD. And then you can think of the true domain, if you want, or the effective domain, as it's called, of the function as those points for which f of x is finite. Okay, those points x for which f of x is finite. This is the true domain of a function. So, so if you take a, a convex function on a convex set, a, a subset of RD, you can always define it to be plus infinity outside, and this will be a, a convex extension. Okay, so you know you can go from one to the other without loss of generality. And uh, uh, perhaps it's already become clear, but a prominent example of a convex function I, I, I want to think about is if x uh, is a random variable, let's say taking values in Rd. Then if you look at the mapping, okay, so from Rd to R, okay, union plus infinity, which for a given lambda associates, oops, I forgot the log, this uh, Laplace transform, log of expectation of exponential lambda scalar product x. This is this is convex. Well, this is a convex function. Okay, so yeah, there, there's a proof uh, uh, somewhere in the handwritten notes, but the, the argument is is just uh, Jensen's inequality. Okay, when you when you want to prove the this property, you use uh, sorry Hölder's inequality. Hölder's inequality with exponents one over alpha and one over one minus alpha. So yeah, I encourage you to uh, check this out. Okay, so another definition I, I want to introduce. So, so now I, I define convex function. I want to define lower semi-continuous. So we say that 
f is lower semi-continuous. I'm going to also use LSC sometimes. Uh, if uh, for every sequence Xn converging to X, we have the, the following inequality. So I want that f of x is always uh, below the limit of f of xn. So maybe this does not talk to you very much. If you if you know about sublevel sets, this asks that the the sublevel sets of the function be closed. So graphically, maybe a drawing is always best better than than. Uh, Lots of formulas. So, well, when you take a convex function on RD, it's always going to be uh, continuous and, in fact, uh, local ellipses on its effective domain. So, the things that can, that, that it can only go bad at the boundary of the domain, of the effective domain. So, you know, a convex function which would, would not be lower semi-continuous would, for instance, look like this. So maybe you have, okay, it's, this is the, the convex function. Okay, maybe uh, it almost lo looks non-convex near the end, but uh, let's say it's convex. And then at this point, the value it takes is actually uh, above here. You know? There's no continuity at the boundary. This is the value at this specific point at the boundary. And then it's plus infinity. Then I, I'm going to draw like this. This is the plus infinity value. Does it make sense the the, the drawing I do? So if, if if you think it's a, you can think it's a one-dimensional example. The horizontal axis is the variable, and on the vertical axis I'm displaying the value of the function. So it's it's this continuous curve, and then at some point, let's say it's uh, at zero, there is a jump for the value of the function, and then to the right of this of this point, the value the function is plus infinity. So, so this is a convex function, but it's not lower semi-continuous. Because if I approach uh, this, this continuity point from the left, I will get a limit which is below the value of f of x. Okay, so this is not LSC. But it's easy to make it LSC by just changing the value at this boundary point. Okay, so maybe we can do like this. Okay, so I'm going to maybe, let me see if I can copy this. Oops. <laughs> uh, maybe this, yes. So what I'm going to do is just decide that now the, the value of the function is, is just here. And then it's plus infinity. Okay, and this is LSC. Okay, so this lower semi-continuity thing is, is something about, uh, you know, like uh, making sure that the guys at the boundary are not uh, are not jumping away. And now um, let me do two remarks. Um, the supremum of convex function. Is always convex. So this you can you can check from the definition. And and separately from that, a, a supremum of lower semi-continuous function, whether or not they are convex, is always lower semi-continuous. Okay, and this perhaps, at least the, the way I like to think about it is uh, using this characterization in terms of sublevel sets. And the the sublevel sets are closed. This is an equivalent way to say the function is lower semi-continuous. And if you think about the sublevel sets of a soup, this is the intersection of the sublevel sets. So you're taking intersections of closed sets, so it's going to be closed. Okay. 
Um, and so um, what I'm going to, so, so as, we, as we stand here, I, I want to make this observation that if I ever manage to write a function as a supremum of affine functions, then this function will have to be convex and low semi-continuous because affine functions are convex and they are low semi-continuous. And, and the, the surprising thing is that this is actually a, su a sufficient condition. Any function which is convex and low semi-continuous can be written as a supremum of affine functions. And, and in fact, this is at least, a, this is one geometric way to think about convex duality. So, so let me uh, reintroduce the, the convex dual. So again, I'm using this, uh, this F star. Ah, yeah, <laughs> sorry, sub-level sets. Yeah, uh, like, please feel free to, uh, to ask a question. Like, uh, I will not be, there's no uh, problem with asking about the pronunciation questions. I, I'm trying to, I'm going to try to speak uh, more clearly, but uh, it's, uh, it's not already. Ah, so here I should take scalar product. It is in RD, so now it's lambda scalar product x minus f of x. This is the, the convex dual of the function f. And so, so by definition, you see that f star of lambda for any lambda and x, this is larger than lambda dot x minus f of x. So just uh, you know, if I rearrange things, I have f of x, uh, which is, oh, sorry, I meant, yes, no, that's, that's right. f of x is always larger than lambda dot x minus f star of lambda. And you see that in some sense, this f star of lambda is defined as being the largest possible value such that this is true. So you can think of, uh, if you believe the thing I said about uh, a convex function is the supremum of affine functions, for any slope, we are trying to find the best possible intercept, which so that the, the affine function still remains below the function f. Okay, so f of x, I want to find the, the best possible value uh, here, which makes it so that the inequality is still valid. And, and so by definition, this is F star of lambda. And, and, and the theorem I, I want to insist upon, which, uh, which I believe is, a, is really remarkable and, and which maybe does not look uh, so impressive when you first see it, but in fact, uh, can really do many things for you. Um, yeah, I believe this is really one of the most uh, useful results in analysis. So a function, okay, especially if you if you do a, also a, a variant where you don't assume that the function is defined on R D, but maybe also on uh, infinite dimensional spaces. So here I'm, I'm just sticking to R D, but. Uh, a function f from Rd to R union plus infinity is convex and lower semi-continuous if and only if it is equal to its uh, bidual. So, so you see that when, when, when I reach this stage here with this inequality, I mean, on the right-hand side, I can take the supremum over lambda. And the supremum over lambda, this is really the dual of the dual of f. That's what I call this uh, b-dual or bi-dual. 
Yeah, maybe uh, later I will ask if I should say by dual or be dual. Maybe by dual. So, so it's clear that f is always uh, larger than or equal to its by dual. And the statement here is that, in fact, as soon as the function is convex and lower semi continuous, we have equality here. Okay, and uh, yes, yeah, so, so this. Uh, again, I think is is useful to know. So this, I'm not going to to prove it. It's not in the yes, it's not in the notes. I did not provide a proof in the notes. So if you if you want a proof, you can you can look into. And it depends on your taste. But personally, I like the the book of Eklund and Teman on convex analysis. This is a B. I think it's just all, I know, maybe it's called the uh, convex analysis and variational problems. I, I like it because it's very to the point. Like uh, you know, on page five, maybe you already have the proof. Or maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. But, um, but another possible reference is the book by Brisdis on functional analysis, also has the proof. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of uh, running uh, out of time, but I, I said uh, the important things I wanted to say today. So today was a bit fast, but uh, rest reassured. Uh, so ultimately, you know, when we enter the, the core of the matter, I'm going to uh, slow things down somewhat. So if you thought that was a, a bit too much, uh, yeah, please uh, uh, stay stay with me for for a little more. Th this was today was to try to give these background uh, results, which I think are are interesting. But you you don't need to absorb all of this uh, in some very deep sense in order to appreciate what's coming next. Um, yeah, what else did I want to say? Yes, so, so perhaps the, the one useful, useful thing you can do, um, so, so have a look at uh, exercise two of problem set one, if, if it's not already done, because it's in the spirit of this derivation with the Bernoulli random variable we, we have done at the beginning. And also, I think it's interesting to see how this gertner ellis uh, argument works. So this, this large deviation principle Assuming that the the, the function psi is C one, at least I find it interesting, and and you can find the argument in the in the handwritten notes. So I think it's yeah, it's maybe a, a useful thing to have a look at. Um, 